Hello and welcome to Rebel Heroines, the podcast celebrating the rebel heroines of the Greek myths and the women who write about them. In this last episode of the year, I interview Ioana Papadopoulou, author of Demeter Origin Retelling Winter Harvest. I've just finished reading Ariadne Unraveled by Zenobia Neal and it was very satisfying as well as the very sexy and passionate marriage of equals between Ariadne and Dionysus. We also get to meet Hephaestus, and Dionysus goes to Olympus as the new god who's eager to be accepted. And there's also an exciting descent into the underworld where we meet Semele, mother of Dionysus, and it's good to meet her. Recommend this book for all Ariadne Dionysus fans. I've also finished Medusa's Sisters by Laura J.A. Bear and also enjoyed that because we get to meet the other two Gorgons and all three of them have very distinct personalities that sometimes clash but are ultimately bound by sisterhood with the bittersweet knowledge that Medusa is mortal and her sisters aren't. One of their adventures, we get to meet a very different young Semele. Then after her unfortunate demise, they move on to Athens. And of course, that's where it all goes wrong for Medusa when she meets Athena. But it's interesting because after Medusa's fate is sealed, we spend the rest of the novel seeing how the aftermath affects her sisters and what happens to them. Another great retelling that I recommend. So, from one powerful woman who's often a footnote in men's stories to another, let's talk about Winter Harvest. I've just started reading it and straight away was impressed by how the very abstract origin myth of the Greek myths with primordial forces eating their children who then eat their children was seen through Demeter's eyes in a very humanising way. No sooner does she come into existence than she is swallowed by her father and the first being she meets in her father's stomach is her sister Hestia. Hestia who we talked about in the last episode and incidentally my favourite goddess. It was great to see Hestia brought to life and I really like the premise that the reason Hestia's power and personality is so benign compared to the rest of her siblings is because she gives a lot of her power away to nurture her frightened siblings who come after her and look to her for comfort as they grow up in darkness and terror. I like the idea that she could be just as formidable and kick ass just as well as the rest of them, but felt compelled to protect first because she was the first to be in that dark prison alone. She could easily have gone the other way when she came out. And Demeter, after she grows and is released and becomes a mother, is having a very intriguing conflict between her appeasing, nurturing side and this monstrous force inside her that is being baited by her ever more forceful and selfish brothers and I'm eager to see how all this pans out for her. And with that in mind, let's talk to author Ioana about Winter Harvest. Thank you for having me. You have your novel Winter Harvest out now, which focuses on the character of Demeter and her rage and her transformation in response to her daughter's kidnapping. And I just wanted to ask, like, why did you want to make Demeter the protagonist in this myth retelling? Though the Persephone and Hades seduction myth is one of the primary stories, The book is not only about that. The book includes a lot of myths about Demeter and starts at the moment of Demeter's birth and her relationships Mm -hmm. with her family, her deity role and her other children. So I chose to write this because when I was growing up and the way that Greek mythology and the Greek gods were depicted to me as a Greek person, Demeter was always such a prevalent figure. And I was so disappointed when I started reading the English versions and the English translations and the English picture books and children's books of these myths that I realized it's not the same Demeter. There's so much of her that's been stripped away or because the focus is so much on the Persephone and Hades myth, her other mythology has been taken away. So I kind of 
channeled the little girl in me that used to love those stories and used to find her such an interesting character because she was the only one that kind of managed to stand against Zeus and make her case and win her case. And I thought that's a really unique story and a really interesting story because it's kind of the only time I can think of in my I'm not an expert in Greek mythology, but obviously I know a lot because I grew up with it, that Zeus lost, that he did not get his way. And I really wanted to explore that through the lens of gender power dynamics and family dynamics. And the little girl in me wanted to correct this version of Demeter that I felt everyone else was seeing. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to transform her from this weeping, potentially overbearing mother to an entity that is far beyond her place in Persephone's story. This is like the Persephone, hey, Dee's Demeter novel that we need because it's like, hey, Demeter's here as well, guys. Yes, yeah, she is the only one as well that I can think of that stands up to Zeus and has this massive impact on, well, the future of the Olympians, really, isn't it? Because if all the mm-hmm. mortals starve, you know... <laughs> is so important and really interesting that we get to have her origin story as well. Great that we Mm -hmm. have a chance to explore that. I interviewed Matilda Lacer recently who has, have you read No Season But The Summer? Yes, it's, it's not been a recent read, but I've read it. I really liked in that novel that she puts Demeter, Persephone and Hades like in the modern world and kind of mm-hmm. references like issues around climate change and stuff. I just wanted to ask, like, why do you think the Demeter, Persephone, Hades myth is so popular and continues to inspire adaptations? I think it's kind of a catch-22 cycle as well. Like the more you do it, the more well-known it gets. Mm. And that's why more people want to do their own versions of it. But I Mm. think especially in the 21st century, it is a story that has a lot of layers that can be uncovered because obviously Mm. there's the issue of consent, there is the issue Mm. of age, there is the issue of patriarchy and family dynamics that we consider very archaic, but they're still Mm maybe a little prevalent in small doses in everyday reality. And I think the myth is allowing a lot of writers and readers when they experience the works to both explore these issues, but also at the same time, a lot of people that love those myths are changing them to fit the 21st dynamic. And Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of that element that people are really interested in because It is a really popular story. So immediately as a story that a lot of people are aware of as the general concept is going to draw readers because it's known. But at the same time, it does allow, I think, for a lot of reimagining because you can either have it as a really terrible story or you can have it as a much more romantic story. And obviously, in my opinion, it's a terrible story in its original Mm. context. (laughs) Yes. A lot of more modern reimaginings are trying to make it seem a little bit nicer. So they are Mm. removing in a lot of the modern retellings, especially ones that are set in the modern world, and they're kind of removing more and more layers of the ancient past. They're making the story be without the incest, without the abduction, without the father that doesn't give permission, but Mm. disregards the mother. So it's really... I think a versatile myth. And it's primarily, though, versatile because it's been retold. So because it's been retold, more and more thoughts about it exist. And that's, Mm -hmm. in some ways, the biggest problem, even with the figure of Persephone, because Persephone is not just her abduction. There is more mythology about her. But Mm -hmm. that's never really channeled either into these retellings. And I think it's kind of the same problem that we have with Troy, as another example that it's such a popular story. So there's again and again and again, more and more stories being written about it. And they always focus on very specific characters, on very specific, like, favorite parts of the Iliad Mm. and of the Odyssey. But um, really, the mythology even of those Homeric works is much Mm. bigger, and of those characters is also bigger. So going back to, like, Persephone and Demeter in my work, I really wanted to explore beyond that very well-known Homeric hymn. Wonderful. So, yeah, it would be 
good to get a bit of an inkling about some of Demeter's other myths outside of the Persephone abduction story that we're used to. Well, I'd say that, and maybe it comes into contrast with the title of this podcast, but my Demeter is not a hero. My Demeter mm-hmm. is a goddess, and as a goddess, she is also a villain in a lot of stories. And for mm. the mortals that she controls, she is full of contradictions and full of danger. Right. The example I always give is that the epithets of Demeter are very dark as well. Like, she does encompass a really dangerous side and I think that is very much aware of by the people that worship her and that's Mm. why even though people forget it Demeter is also a chthonic goddess is a goddess related to death through the Elefsian mysteries and through her connection Mm -hmm. with Persephone so Persephone's abduction doesn't only change Persephone it changes Demeter's role in society as well and in worship so in terms of myths the one that I would imagine people don't know as much as about her children, Vespina and Arion, which is the children she had after she was raped by Poseidon. And one of them is a horse and the other one is Arcadian goddess of vegetation and wildlife. And a lot of her myths are related to her travels while she was searching for Persephone, but they're kind of independent stories. And then there's some stories that are after the abduction very clearly, which is like the story of Erisichthion, who is a prince in Thessalia, and he insulted the sacred grove and the sacred dryad of Demeter. So she cursed him with insatiable hunger. He ended up eating himself. And then there were myths that I was like really scared of writing because I couldn't really bring myself to add them as well in the sagas, which is about Demeter and her lovers, human Mm. lovers. So there's like a whole range of things that you could do. But I primarily focused on the story of Demeter's origins. Mm -hmm. So her time in the stomach of her father and her search for Persephone and then one extra layer, which was the first time she was waiting for Persephone to come back after the agreement had been reached. So I added a few myths there as well. But there's an entire lifetime, I think, of Demeter beyond it. That is all her lovers and even more children that she had and her smaller dates that accompanied her. I always saw her as that older version of women that don't necessarily need to get married. But for that reason as well, and that was why I was really scared of writing this, is that she's obviously been abused. And that is definitely the case. There's been like her as a female goddess of power has been abused by Mm -hmm. other gods. And then when she has her human lovers, there's the element of power, but how it's swapped. Her lovers are... In some of the iterations that I've read, they've been enchanted. And I think mm. there's quite an interesting concept there is whether she's now the sexual abuser as well, because she's so overpowering them, can they really consent? So that mm. was something I did not uh, feel comfortable or ready to delve into, like her role after she stops being the victim. And that was something that is really interesting in terms of power dynamics and gender dynamics, because I think when a male god goes towards a human mortal woman, the power dynamic is still, I think, much clearer. Mm. So the woman, though, is still married, is still having a part of herself that is separate from the god. And it's just that the Mm. god goes and takes over when they want to. But with a human male lover, I cannot think of a single time where the male lover of a female goddess would be allowed to have a wife, would be allowed to have a life beyond that relationship. And it's the same from when you have even the relationships between male gods and male humans. Again, that gender power is really uncomfortable and that's why it leads so often to the human lover's death. Because she's seen as it's okay because she's lower in both situations, there's no class of discomfort. While with female goddesses, there's a really deep unsettling element of the female being hierarchically stronger Mm. But as the gender, the man should be stronger. And there's a really big contrast there and a really big difficulty, I think, with ancient Greek world to depict that. And that's why it's so unhappy stories. 
Just like with Adonis as well, like he has a pretty interesting trajectory between Aphrodite and um, Persephone, yeah. What it really tells me as a person is the fear of women in power. I think even mm. at that very mythological element is that fear of not following gender stereotypes and gender hierarchies and the man is always on top of the woman. And even mm. when you have it as a goddess, that still yeah. makes people uncomfortable. And I like that that whole aspect of talking about Demeter as a platonic goddess as well and all these, like her mystery cults and all that, like she had, did have so much power. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, there was a darkness to that power. And yet it's almost this thing of the male gods. It's almost like a sort of given that it's okay, that like the dread gods and we're afraid of them. But it, it's almost this surprise with the goddesses around the myths that we know that yeah a lot of them again have this kind of dark aspect but it's almost like we don't really want to go there be reminded that we should be afraid of them as well Mm -hmm. so is this your first full-length novel it's the first published did you have the whole plot in your head when you started writing or did it evolve naturally when you decided you wanted to focus on Demeter and her other myths I think because I had the mythology to guide me For the most part, it was really strong, the concept of what I was going to write. And it was more of some smaller myths that I added as incidents that maybe they weren't there from the very beginning. But the very basic structure of the novel was, for me, really clear from the very beginning. Because I, I was really conscious and I really wanted to follow as much as I could the myths and not really play with them. I I wanted to be creative in the spaces in between the myths rather than in the myths themselves. Mm -hmm. And because Demeter has not been a major figure in literary works of the ancient world, this actually was a blessing in disguise because I got a lot of myths through geographers who all they would do is give me a very short description of the myth. So then I kind of didn't have a lot of details to ground me. So I could then take those myths. And as long as I stayed within that very generic summary that I was given, I was still following that. So Mm. the major literary works I chose to really follow close is the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which is the major source for the Persephone abduction. And then it was also the Kalimachus hymn to Demeter, which is where you get the Erisichthon story primarily and with the most details. I think that's what I really love about this genre as well, the opportunity to fill in the gaps and give these stories like a whole new perspective that feels very modern. Following on from that, I wanted to ask why you think these like feminist female author-led retellings of Greek mythology have, have kind of had such a resurgence over the years and if you have a favourite novel in this genre. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> I don't think I can answer for a favorite. I can say that the last book I read from Greek mythology retellings that really captivated my mind, so many of them have captivated my mind when mm-hmm. I've read them in that time, is Alcest this so it's the story of Alcest this booty uh, who was such a good wife and so in love with her husband that she ended up going to the underworld in his place. So the book really explores the relationship of Alcestis with these other characters and really tries to give her agency. And I found the author's name. It's Catherine Butner. So it's an interesting one because it was written right as Song of Achilles was also written. But Song of Achilles was like such a big phenomenon while that book yeah. was not so strong. And I think that's a really interesting idea about the feminist retellings of mythology as well, because I feel that in many ways we're so interested in them because the Greek mythology stories are so interesting, Mm. but they are so male-focused. So that creates, I think, with this younger generation, a problem of connecting with them. And then people have like slowly, it's not been like a sudden change, it's been a slow interest of trying to look at women within this patriarchal male-focused mythologies and seeing their stories. And I think that the reason why we're so interested in them is because they have a lot to tell us about how the world today has not changed. Yes. (laughs) I think that's the part. I think maybe a lot of the male stories, if you look at them, they probably don't fit the world 
on the surface as much as we do, but I think the female experience of these mythological women, of the goddesses, of the of the women that have been abducted, taken, even if you remove the most violent extremities, the experience of gender dynamic has not fully changed in the world. It's not the same, but I think there's enough of a correlation to make it interesting. And that's, I think, maybe where my voice is slightly different because I did not grow up in the most standard Western family. I grew up in a Greek family, which has a lot of Eastern influences. There's a lot of different societal ideas that probably in some ways are a tiny bit backwards. <laughs> but for me, there's so many elements of family dynamics and family hierarchies and family-centric power that really remains the same in um, ancient Greek mythology. And that's kind of the strand, I think, that also really interested me. Great stuff. Would you like to read us an extract from Winter Harvest? Yes, so I'm going to read the prologue, which some people love it, some people don't. We'll see what your listeners think. I personally love a prologue, so (laughs) I'm up for it. (laughs) So, I told myself that letting my little brother run his rough hands all over me was simply an act of initiation and a way for him to gesture power. It wasn't me prostituting myself. Similarly, I told myself that making sure my womb clutched onto his seed and turned it into my firstborn child, my Cory, my Persephone, was an act of love. It was evidence of my need to become a mother and have someone to call my own. It wasn't an attempt to hold leverage against him. Sometimes, though, when I'm alone and I fall into the admittedly rare mood of self-criticism, I wonder whether I'm lying to myself. Am I just finding excuses? The same as all my family has done for all the evil we have committed against others, even against each other. I am, after all, from a family of kinslayers. Oh, see, that's why I love a prologue, because straight away it feels like this is a different kind of Demeter than the one the general public is used to, like, the rebellion, her darkness, her power. Self-hatred. Yes. The fact that she even has self-doubt rather than this thing that the gods have mm-hmm. of like they're on top and they don't even mm-hmm. worry about it. You know, straight away, I want to read this book. <laughs> My um, desire with writing Dimmer was about a goddess that was trying to not become a chthonic creature, mm-hmm. trying not to become linked with death. Once it decided to be, then it was kind of like a point of no return. Yes, that's fascinating. Where can we get the book? And are you doing like any kind of launches or anything like that? So where could we potentially see you to hear more? Nothing is uh, arranged for a launch, but I am hoping maybe to do some events locally in Scotland. So I will be updating whether that is possible through my website, through Instagram and through Twitter. I'm on Blue Sky. I'm kind of trying to be everywhere social media is, (laughs) too many places. Yeah. But you can buy the book on Amazon. You can buy it through the Indie uh, Publishers Network, which is newly set up. You can buy it through Waterstones, through all the major websites. And I think uh, outside of the UK, you can also find it in Barnes & Nobles, in Kobo. I've seen it in quite a few bits and bobs places and I'm trying to contact independent bookshops to suggest the stock, maybe a copy or two. So mm. I think most places that you can find a book, you'll probably find a way of getting that book as well. Wonderful. Great stuff. One last question. Do you have plans for any like future Greek mythology inspired novels? Parts of me that want to write I don't know whether it would be novels or novellas or something short. I don't know the length. There's parts of me that want to write Artemis and want to write Rhea as well. That would be Uh, wonderful. I love Rhea. But I am primarily a fantasy author. So my work tends to be more second world fantasy. And in the current uh, work that I am penning right now, it's a very Greek inspired world, but it's a second world fantasy where I've taken really the idea of exploring what it means to be a nymph and what if nymphs as the manifestations of nature through divine power kind of merge nature and consciousness. What does it mean to be a nymph and how does the world look at them and really, they must be terrified. 
I mean, we always see the nymphs as this in the stories of how they are abused by gods, but to the eyes of a mortal person, a nymph must be a terrifying thing. Oh, I love that idea. Terrifying so, nymphs. Mm. So I'm kind of trying to, in the second world fantasy, without being bound to any nymphs, uh, to any mm. specific nymphs or any specific, use the taxonomy of nymphs to explore, to create a world through that lens. Oh, well, I'm definitely looking forward to exploring that world of terrifying nymphs. That sounds fabulous. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about Winter Harvest. And I'm definitely looking forward to reading it and best of luck with it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoy the book. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks so much for listening and to everyone who's engaged with the podcast in its first year. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot as I've deep dive into this world and this genre that I love and interviewed some fantastic authors and creatives and looking forward to interviewing more. And it's also been great to showcase my own creative work and the work of other poets and It would be great to showcase more work from listeners. If you have anything on theme, please do get in touch. Do let me know what you enjoyed about the podcast this year and what you'd like more of next year. Feel free to like, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can find me under Lorna Meehan or Rebel Heroines Podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, please email me at lornaemehan at gmail.com. Please share with anyone who might be interested. And I'll be back in 2024 with more Rebel Heroine goodness. Happy New Year.